Canary tokens are types of honeypots that catches bad actors. In general, they send notification to the user when a hacker accessed the token. Although they have same purpose, each of them has different mechanism to trigger the connection. So in this video, we will explore the internals of these tokens and understand how they operate. Let's first look at some of the most common canary tokens. In this part, let's try creating a PDF token. We need to specify an email that will receive the notification. We will use a disposable email for demonstration purposes. Then we will put something to identify the token. Once created, we can download it on our local disk. Let's go to the terminal. The default file name is the token ID, but typically we will specify this to something interesting for the attacker. I'm going to open that file in the background using Adobe Acrobat Reader on my host machine. And if we go back to our disposable email, we now see our notification. This includes the details that will identify the bad actor. Now let's look inside the token and see how it works. First thing we want to try is to perform static analysis on the strings inside the PDF file. We know that this is a valid PDF. Let's try to get the printable characters using strings command. We don't see anything related to Canary. We are trying to look for strings containing the Canary token URL. Let's try XXD. Even if we try to do a hex dump, we can't see any reference about the URL. We see a lot of these, but we don't know yet what it means. We can assume that they are part of the PDF format. Other than that, we don't really see anything of value here. Probably the Canary URL is hidden somewhere inside these objects. But if we try to use a tool like this, we can see the Canary URL. Question is, how did it extract it? And how does it get triggered whenever we open the file? In order to answer those questions, we first need to understand some basic information about PDF structure. I have here a sample PDF structure. I know this format is very unfamiliar for most of us, but I will explain the important parts. Let's go first at the bottom of the file. This includes one of the important part of a PDF file, which is the cross-reference table. It says here that it is located at byte offset of 478. That will be on this part. The cross-reference table tells us the location of the different objects in the PDF. The PDF structure consists of objects and streams, which are binary data. That's the reason why we did not see any plain text reference to the Canary URL when using standard Linux utilities. The first object in the table is at byte offset zero, meaning it is on the start of the file. PDF objects are identified using this format. The object number, the generation number, which is just like the version of the object. Then it ends with this identifier. The content of an object is in a form of a dictionary that consists of a key and value pair separated by spaces. Keys may come in different types. In this example, we have a key that points to another object in the PDF. Let's go back to the cross-reference table at the bottom. Same format is followed for the location of other objects. Object 2 is located on byte offset 9, but third object is on 62nd byte, and so on. There are different types of objects. Some examples would be a dictionary, string, number, or a boolean. There are also stream objects, which are binary data and harder to read. We have here an example of a stream object. It has a dictionary, which contains the length of the stream, then the stream itself. Some streams like this may expose readable characters, but most part will be just garbage. Since we were not able to read the Canary URL from the PDF file a while ago using standard Linux commands, it is safe to assume that it is embedded inside a stream object. There is a very nice tool that can extract the PDF objects for us, even the unreadable ones. It is called QPDF. I put the link in the description so you can check it out yourself. I already built the tool inside my Kali, so it's now ready for use. We need to specify the input file, which is the one we got from Canary site, then the output file that will contain the readable data. We also need to specify the format, which is QPDF. There are other formats like JSON, but we won't explore it in this video. Let's run it. If we try to open the output file, we see similar structure from what we discussed. And we see now the Canary URL, which is embedded inside an object as a stream. In this case, this stream is being referenced from another one, which is object 16. If we look at the bottom, there is a garbage data. This might be the object 16, which is where the canary URL was originally embedded. So we are correct on our assumption that it is hidden inside of binary data. But this alone is not enough to trigger the callback to the website. It is just setting the link to the URL. So how does it get triggered? Let's remember that our canary URL is on object 14. And if we try to search the whole structure for any object that referenced this, we see a result here. It is under an active actions dictionary. Inside that, 
there is a key which is slash O. This stands for unopen, which means go to this link when the document is opened. The value pointed to by that action is the canary URL. So that's the process of triggering the HTTP connection. There is a link embedded inside a stream object. Then there is an active action that connects to that link every time the document is opened. Do note that this type of action may not be supported by all PDF clients. This means that this kind of canary token is easy to bypass as you can just use a different program to open the file. But it is very interesting how these links are hidden inside this document. This method of uncovering it can also use in analyzing malware embedded inside PDF files. Next thing we want to explore is a fake SQL dump file. We want to know how a canary token is embedded inside. So let's create one and download it on our local disk. We'll use again a disposable email for demonstration purposes. And let's just put some random description. Let's download the file. Then going back to our terminal, we see here the compressed file. Let's unzip it. To analyze this properly, let's launch a MySQL container so we can import it. Then copy the dump file to the container. If we try to open the file, there is a lot of garbage inside. With this amount of data, it will be hard to find the location of the token. Since these tokens are meant to be hidden, we can assume that they may be inside a base64 encoded string. So let's look for some statements that may contain the canary URL. We see one hit. If we move further up, we can see the base64 encoded string. We have a user-defined variable called S2, which is getting the value from another user-defined variable, which is B. After that, there is a series of prepared statements. Then last is it tries to trigger replication. In order to perform a MySQL replication, we must connect to the source database. The information on how to connect to the source may be hidden inside the base64 string, so let's try to decode it. The replication settings is indeed inside the base64 encoded string. This is trying to replicate the source database into the local database. That means when an attacker tries to import this fake SQL dump, the replication will kick off. We have here the credentials for the source database, source port, and the source host, which is pointed to the Canary site. Let's get the IP and monitor the traffic in Wireshark and go inside the container. Then let's try to simulate an attacker importing the fake SQL dump file. We need to specify the target database. Let's use MySQL for demonstration purposes. I'll turn on verbose so we can see that the statements are being executed. Once that is done, we should see it connecting to the Canary site and receive an email notification. So in summary, Canary tokens are embedded inside a fake SQL dump file through a base64 encoded string. There are a series of prepared statements that will be executed once the dump is imported. This method can also be used in analyzing unknown dump files that may contain malware. And you need to be aware that importing a dump file may execute different commands, so be very cautious. Now let's have a look how tokens are triggered when accessing Kubernetes clusters. Talking to the Kubernetes API is done via kube config file. Let's put a disposable email then some random description, and download it. Let's go to the terminal and see how this file looks like. The cube config file contains the address of the Kubernetes API server. Default port is 6443, but in most production setup, it is on 443. Let's try to connect to this URL manually using curl and see if we will trigger a notification. We got an error, but our TLS connection is successful. Let's go to our disposable email and see. Nothing here. Let's refresh. Still nothing, so there must be something wrong on how we tried to connect to Kubernetes API server. In order to authenticate, we need to present different things. First is the CA certificate, then the client certificates. Let's try to pass these parameters in curl and see if we will receive a different response. The cube config file we downloaded from Canary site contains base64 encoded certificates, so we need to decode them first. Now that we have the certificates, let's pass them to curl. We don't have an error anymore. We can ignore the authorization issue since this is just a fake cube config file. Let's go to our disposable email and see if we receive something. We can see now a notification. This means connecting to Kubernetes using that manner is enough to trigger an alert. That is also the same thing on how we would normally do it, which is via kubectl command. There must be something on the Canary end that watches for API requests because Kubernetes itself by default doesn't have the capability to trigger something upon receiving connections from clients. Finding out how things work like this is a good exercise. Aside from learning new technologies, this will improve our reverse engineering skills, which is very useful, especially when protecting ourselves from malwares. I hope you learned something today. If you found this valuable, please like and subscribe to support my channel. See you on the next one.